Hello and welcome to lecture 16 of the course Microelectronics Lab. This is a theory module for deep level transient spectroscopy. We'll, to begin with, we will give you a brief introduction of different type of defects um, and their sources. We will talk about how these defects uh, and traps lead to different kind of reliability concerns and how do we characterize all of them. Uh, then we'll develop a brief understanding or quick understanding of the trap statistics. Then we'll get into the DLTS basic principle. For instance, concept of rate window, understanding DLTS signal, extracting trap information and so, far, so on. Uh, we'll talk about the key features of a typical DLTS setup. We'll discuss the hardware setup. Uh, we'll describe that in detail, we'll describe measurement flow and the software capabilities of uh, typical DLTS uh, instruments. Um, and then towards the end, we'll talk about different type of DLTS measurements possible like uh, DDLTS, IDLTS, optical DLTS. And then uh, we'll also discuss the key measurement concern and these different uh, DLTS techniques. Hello, I am Rajesh Shridhar Choudhury and I welcome you to the lecture number 16. In this lecture, we will talk about theoretical aspects of a measurement technique used to detect defects and traps in a semiconductor material. This measurement technique is known as deep level transient spectroscopy. In this lecture presentation, we will discuss the theory and the working principle of this measurement technique. This presentation is structured as follows. First, we'll introduce you to defects. We'll talk about various sources of defects, various types of defects, what parameters are used to identify a defect, and what would be the effect of the presence of defects in the semiconductor devices. Then we'll go on to understand how these defects or trapped states interact with carriers in the semiconductor. For example, how electrons and holes are trapped or detrapped from these trapped states. What are the rate of their capture and emission? what would be the effect of electrical bias on the trap population and how we would measure these capture and emission processes in terms of some observable parameters, in this case capacitance, current or charge transients. We will then learn how to understand capacitance transients and find out trap parameters such as emission times, etc. With an understanding of defects and their trap dynamics, we would then go on to understand the basics of the deep level transient spectroscopy measurement. So the key concept central to DLTS measurement is the concept of rate window. We'll, we'll try to understand what rate window is. We'll then understand how a DLC, DLTS signal is generated and what it means. We'll try to interpret a DLTS signal. And then from there, we would like to learn how to extract various trap parameters from a DLTS measurement. Once we understand the basics of DLTS measurement, we'll, we'll, I'll walk you through the key features of the DLTS setup that includes description of the experimental setup, the hardware part, the software capabilities, and the measurement flow involved. Once the basic DLTS setup is introduced to you, we'll cover the way different types of DLTS measurements, such as optical mode DLTS, current mode DLTS, etc. And in the end, we'll highlight various measurement concerns that need to be addressed for carrying out an accurate DLTS measurement on a semiconductor device. So before we begin to understand DLTS measurement, it is important to understand what are defects. Because from as the name suggests, we are going to learn about deep level transient spectroscopy. So what are these deep levels? So before we understand deep levels of which we are going to characterize, we need to understand defects. So to understand defects, the best place is to begin from an ideal crystal. The left hand side of the screen shows an ideal crystal. In the ideal crystal, which is infinite and periodic, this results in a clear band gap. That is, the electron inside this crystal will have properly defined bands, for example, conduction band, valence band, wherein the electron can stay. And these two bands would be separated by a well-defined forbidden gap in which there would be no valid electronic states available. 
However, in reality, due to thermodynamics and other aspects of how you grow the crystal, there would be imperfections in the crystal. That is, there would be breaks in periodicity. You could have vacancies, that is where a lattice atom would be missing. You could have an extra atom present in a position where it shouldn't have been, such as self-interstitials. You could have a missing crystal plane, which, which terminates abruptly, which, such as dislocations. You could have presence of impurities in the crystal, which would cluster out to form impurity clusters, substitutional impurities, and interstitials. All these non-uniformities in the crystal, they lead to break of periodicity. When there is a break in the periodicity, there would be the presence of for states in the electronic states in the forbidden gap. For example, if you look at this figure, in an ideal crystal, you just have the conduction band, you would have the valence band. But the moment you incorporate these vacancies, interstitials, dislocations, grain boundaries, and other sources of defects, which leads to dangling bonds and unsatisfied bonds in the crystal, you would have energy states in the forbidden gap. So this is the forbidden gap, and you can see there are certain energy states that have emerged from the fact that the crystal is finite, because any practical crystal would be finite, and there would always be imperfections, no matter how much you try to avoid them. So these two factors lead to the presence of trap states in the forbidden gap. Okay, there is another so in, in a material, in a typical semiconductor material device, we, in a typical semiconductor device, we would come across stacks of materials. For example, in this schematic I show there are multi, this a heterostructure kind of a structure, heterostructure layer where you see material A deposited over material B, which is deposited over material C. So the, some common sources of defects would be the surface states where you would have unsatisfied bonds, the dynamic bonds. And also the interface between material A and B, material B and C, which leads to disorder-induced defect states. So typically it is seen that at surfaces and interfaces, you will have a continuum of states present in the forbidden gap. And typically in the bulk of a crystal, you would see defect states with discrete energy levels. So these are the two possible scenarios of defects in semiconductor and their consequences on the energy band. So while working with semiconductors, the early encounter with defects led us to an understanding that these defects play an important role in ensuring that your devices are reliable or not. So this would determine whether your how your devices would behave. Some early, some early encounters with defects include how the first prototype of an FET, field effect transistor, had failed. So if you look at the schematic here, this is the schematic of an ideal field effect transistor, where it was expected that you take an n-type piece of semiconductor, you, you take another electrode separated by air, and you apply a bias. So if, if you apply a positive bias, it was expected that electrons would accumulate near the surface, so that it would lead to accumulation of electrons. And therefore, if you apply negative bias, the electrons would be depleted. But it was found out that in reality, that this input terminal was not at all able to modulate the conductivity of this yellow, silicon, yellow semiconductor piece depicted here. In reality, there was no control of the input terminal on this semiconductor. Why was it so? Why did it fail? Why did the input field not modulate the conductivity here? It was found out that although there were free electrons trying to accumulate on the surface due to the application of positive charges, but these free electrons were being immobilized. They were not able to move. It was then proposed by Bardeen Bardin is the trio responsible for the development of the first transistor, Shockley, Bertin, and Bardin. So Bardin proposed 
that the immobilization of these free electrons could be because of the presence of surface states. As I discussed in the previous slide, in the surface you would have lots of dangling bonds which are unsatisfied. These dangling bonds would immediately trap electrons once they accumulate near the surface. And therefore all the field lines would be completely terminated in the first few layers of the surface. And therefore it will not at all be able to modulate the conductivity of this piece of semiconductor. So what was the solution to this problem? You have to somehow satisfy the dangling bonds in the surface. So in 1947, the first class of transistors evolved by solving this problem wherein they used an electrolyte. This electrolyte's job was to provide charges to satisfy these dangling bonds and thereby allow the input con control terminal which we in our modern day terms call as gate allow it to modulate the conductivity of the semiconductor. The other methods used were surface cleaning techniques to remove the surface state traps and passivation of the surface states using noble dielectrics. So you see from 1947 where this primitive transistor structure is shown here to 2014 from a silicon transistor to gallium nitride modern day high power transistors the attempt to tame surface states remains challenging and this challenge is complex because of the emergence of newer and newer material systems. Therefore this shows how defects still continue to play a very critical role in device design. The audience can refer to a book by William Shockley for a greater understanding of why the first prototype of the field effect transistor failed as I discussed. Okay, now that we understand that defects are very important towards development of robust devices, let us see some common sources of defects in semiconductors. Defects in semiconductors emerge from the act of doping. Doping means introduction of a foreign particle, foreign atom inside the crystal. This, in, this introduction of a foreign atom could be intentional or it could be unintentional. Typically, intentional doping is done to control the conductivity. In fact, in silicon, one can vary conductivity by an order of six or more than six orders of magnitude and achieve various types of conductivity just by, con by, just by doping, by suitably doping the piece of silicon. A piece of silicon could be intrinsic and then it could be heavily doped and you can get six orders of conductivity or resistivity difference. It should be noted that intentional doping is generally completely controllable by controlling the growth by controlling the growth parameters or implantation parameters. And these dopants which affect the conductivity are generally shallow levels. However, the challenge is posed by the unintentional doping or unintentional introduction of foreign atoms. These are termed as impurities rather than dopants because they are introduced unintentionally during growth or various device processing steps. The very fact that they are unintentional, it leads to the fact that they are not controllable because you do not know from where they are getting incorporated. So these are mostly uncontrollable. And the most challenging part of unintentional impurities are that they may introduce deep levels the semiconductor. So why do we study, why do we still study defects? Are they still relevant? As I shown you in the earlier slides that from 1947 to 2014 and till date, till date as 2D materials are emerging, as newer material systems are emerging, defect analysis and understanding the effect on device degradation is remains an open question. In this slide, I would highlight few electrical consequences in a device because of the presence of defect states. In one of our devices, in gallium nitride devices, in a very recent study, we saw, we saw that the moment one shines UV in our MOS, metal oxide semiconductor structure based on gallium nitride wide band gap semiconductor, 
we saw that there was a strong shift in threshold voltage. So this ambient lighting condition dependent shift in the transfer characteristics of the transistor makes the transistor unreliable and it shows that there must be some states. In this case, the, it was attributed to the presence of deep traps in the oxide semiconductor interface which reacted to the shining of UV light. So this leads to a common problem called threshold voltage instability. Another major challenge is you design a transistor which is supposed to give a certain amount of current under saturated condition in on state. That is the maximum current handling capability of the transistor. You would find out that after prolonged use of the transistor, after the transistor goes through stresses, there is severe reduction in the on current of the transistor. One can also notice hysteresis in the transfer characteristics, in the IDVG characteristics, as one as one goes from the reverse sweep to the forward sweep. In this case, it is shown for a bilayer MOS2 device in a recent study. Also, the presence of such defects leads to constant trapping and detrapping of channel carriers in the gate dielectric, which leads to noise in the current. So we see threshold voltage instability, on current reduction, transfer curve, hysteresis and current fluctuations, all because of defects. Therefore, the summary is that the defects make the devices unreliable. Okay, so now that we know that it is important to understand defects and characterize them because we need to develop robust devices, we need to identify the parameters by which we would know a defect or which we would mark a defect. So the various parameters used for defect identification are charge states, its energy level, its capture kinetics and its physical location. Charge state, so, so a defect state can be donor type or acceptor type. If it is a donor type and if it is filled with an electron, so let us say you are talking about a phosphorus atom in a silicon which is a donor, donor in silicon. And if it is not yet donated its charge, you would say that that level is filled. The, the level introduced by phosphorus in silicon is still filled with an electron and the atom is neutral. The charge state is neutral. But the moment the electron is donated by phosphorus to the conduction band of silicon, that phosphorus acquires a positive charge. So donors which have excess electrons to be given they are neutral when the electrons are already present, but the moment they donate those electrons and become empty, they acquire positive charge. Similarly, think about acceptors, for example, boron in, in silicon. So, typically uh, the boron would, ha have, would have a space to, uh, to accommodate an electron in its neutral condition. So in its neutral condition, when it is zero, zero charge state, it is empty. But the moment it takes an electron from the silicon, it becomes negatively charged. So an acceptor is empty and its charge state is zero when it is empty. And when the acceptor becomes filled by an electron, it becomes negatively charged. So this is how you can identify whether a charge state is an, whether the defect level is a donor type defect or an acceptor type defect depending on the charge profile. Now depending on the energy level, a defect can be characterized as shallow defect and deep defects. Shallow defects are those defect levels which are present within the 3 kT range from the conduction or valence band. That is room temperature, it would be around 72 milli electron volts of the order of that. If the energy level of the defect is deeper than this number, that is if the energy level of the defect state, that is Et, is well separated from the conduction or valence band, then we would call it as a deep level, deep, deep, deep level defect. So by the way, in this deep level characterization, we are looking towards characterizing these deep level defects which generally do not respond to normal bias or stress conditions, normal bias condition, normal bias conditions for characterizing those defects. Okay, 
Now the third aspect of identifying a defect is its capture kinetics. So a defect is known by its capture cross section. That is its area of influence inside the material. It determines how efficiently those defects can capture or emit carriers that pass by the defect state. Okay. So in addition to these three parameters, we have another important aspect of a defect level, which is the physical location of the defect. It is important because if the defect is present at a certain region in the device, it would affect the device characteristics in one way. For example, if it is below the gate, it is more likely that the threshold voltage of the device would be significantly affected. Whereas, whereas if it is in a region, in the resistive or ohmic region, it would significantly affect the on resistance characteristics of the device. Therefore, the physical location of the defect level also plays a very, very important role. Okay, but now that we have understood that a defect is known by its charge state, what are the factors that determine the charge state of a defect level? So, if we consider the trap level as ET, then the trap level's charge state is determined whether the trap is filled or empty. Because if you, if you remember the table discussed in the previous slide, a filled state would make the donors neutral and accept as negatively charged, and empty states would make the donors positively charged and the acceptors neutral. Therefore, depending on whether the trap is filled or empty, its charge would be determined. What determines whether a trap would be filled or empty? It would be determined by the location of the Fermi level with respect to that of the trap level. Consider an interface between two materials, A and B, and as I had discussed, the interface would have traps present all along the forbidden gap from the conduction band to the valence band. From, the, from a theory known as disorder induced gap state theory, there would be a certain level called charge neutrality level in the semiconductor interface. Above that level, all the traps would be acceptors denoted by A and all the traps below would be donors. So there is a reason behind this, which I not, which is beyond the scope of this lecture. But these are these are these are the acceptor states near the conduction band, and these are the donor states near the valence band, and these are the intrinsic defect levels which will be present in an interface arising out of the disorder of bonds at the interface. Okay, so let us assume three cases. When the Fermi level shown by this line here, marked as EF, is situated such a way that it covers half of the donor band. So the, this is the band of the levels of donors. Half of them are below the Fermi level. That means these, if an energy level is below the Fermi level, it would be filled by electrons. We know that if a donor is filled by electrons, then its charge state would be zero, right? The other half, which is above the Fermi level, these levels are empty. We know that if the donor states are empty, then it would be positively charged. What about the acceptor states? They are well above the Fermi level, right? The acceptor states are here and the Fermi level is here. So these would all be empty and they would contribute zero charge. Therefore, what is the effective charge of the interface? The effective charge of the interface is positive charge. Now what happens when you apply a certain bias? So when you apply a certain bias, the surface potential would change in response to that bias, right? Because it has to sustain an electric field in response to the bias, which is, which is marked by the band bending here. So let us say someone applies a positive bias at the surface. So the bands bend downwards. So the Fermi level now shifts higher relative to the states at the interface, right? The Fermi level is flat here. The bands have bent down. This is, this is typically seen in a MOS structure, metal oxide semiconductor, where you apply a bias at the metal. And since there cannot be any 
sustained current from in the MOS structure, so the Fermi level would be flat, unaffected. Only the surface, there would be band bending near the surface. And so the Fermi level goes up as the band is going down. So there are, so a situation arises where there are lots of states below the Fermi level. In this case, the whole defect donor band, the D band, the band st donor states, they are all below the Fermi level, right? So they are all filled, filled with electrons. So now some of the acceptor states are all below, also below the Fermi level and they are also filled with the electrons. So the donor states filled with electrons, they are neutral, right? Zero charge. Acceptor states filled with electrons, they are negatively charged. And the remaining acceptor states which are not filled with electrons, which are empty, they are zero charge. So zero, negative, zero. So we see that the interface has become net negative charge. So the interface was initially positive charge, it has now become negative charge. Similarly, what happens when you apply a bias, a negative bias in the MOS structure? So the band bends upward. So now the bands have bent significantly upward and most of the energy levels in the interface are above the Fermi level. So we see that the acceptor states are all above Fermi level and they are all empty. So an empty acceptor is zero charge. Most of the donor states are above the Fermi level. They are all empty. An empty donor state is positively charged. Okay, and so there are very few number of donor states which are below the Fermi level, which are filled. So these states are filled and all these states are empty. So the field would be zero charge. So you again get net positive charge in the interface. So one can notice how the interface, net interface charge is a function of applied electric field. And it shows how the trap population can change by application of electric field because the location of the Fermi level with respect to the trap level changes. Okay, now that we understand the charge state of traps, let us understand of the trap, understand about trap carrier interaction because if you go back to the previous slide, right, we apply a bias such that the bands bend downwards. So the system requires that some levels would now have to be filled, which were initially empty. So how would the trap levels get filled up or how would the trap levels empty? They have to either capture carriers such as electrons and holes or they have to release carriers, electrons and holes. Okay, so to understand the carrier trap interaction processes, let us consider a bulk of semiconductor whose conduction band is shown by EC, conduction band bottom, and the valence band maxima is shown by EV. So in the bulk, let us consider that there is only one defect level present, which is shown by ET. So these are four figures, figure sub part one, part two, part three, part four, drawn here to show different processes. So there are four main processes of trap carrier interaction. So the first process shown here is electron capture. So these electrons in the conduction band can find an empty state. Empty state means where there is no electron, which would be thought of as vacant, which in which an electron can reside, but it's empty. So such a state can capture an electron from the reservoir of electrons. That is, these electrons can come from the conduction band and this process is called electron capture. Okay, so once this electron is captured, this trap state becomes filled up. So just some notification, so some uh, notations that we will be following is an empty state would be marked as PT, an elect a state, a trap state where no electron is present, absence of electron is marked by PT. So the fraction of traps which are empty would be given by this number Pt. The moment the trap, the electron is trapped, the trap state gets filled up and we call it as Nt. So now this electron can go back to the conduction band. So this is another process. So we saw about capture of electron from conduction band. We now see emission of electron from trap state to conduction band. 
not only electrons interact, holes also would interact with these trapped states. So let us say that an electron is filled in this trap state. A hole can be captured by this trap state, marked by this process, in which a hole jumps from valence band to this trap level. Okay, this is called hole capture. Similarly, a hole once captured can be emitted back to the valence band, which is called as hole emission. So emission of a trapped hole from the trap level to the valence band is equivalent to jumping of an electron from valence band to the trap level. Okay, these are equivalent processes, so this dashed arrow is shown here. So there are four processes, electron capture from conduction band to trap, emission of ele trapped electron from trap level to conduction band, capture of hole from valence band to trap, and emission of hole from trap level to the valence band. So all the phenomena of trap carrying interaction would be a permutation and combination of these processes. So I will highlight four common processes that take place, four common phenomena that take place, that is recombination. How do electrons and hole recombine in presence of traps? So you can see for electrons and hole to recombine, they have to come together and annihilate. So we can see from these four processes, if process A is followed by process C, that is if electron is captured first and then a hole is captured, that is process A followed by process C, then the electron hole pair annihilates at the trap level. This leads to recombination of the electrons and holes. There could be another process called generation. In generation, a trap, so generation means this trap level has to contribute an electron to the conduction band and it has to contribute a hole to the valence band. So this trap level by process B can emit an electron and by process D can emit a hole. So process B followed by D is generation of carriers. Okay, so a trap level can take part in generation and recombination. A trap level can also just take part in electron trapping or just hole trapping. How would just electron trapping happen? An electron trapping would mean an electron captured by process A and then emitted by process B. And hole trapping would be captured by process C, emission by process D. So we see that by the permutation combination of these basic processes, we can have recombination, generation, electron trapping, hole trapping. Okay, so there is another important distinction that has to be made. How do you understand if a defect level or a trap level is a normal, is just a carrier trapping level or is it a generation recombination center? Generally, deep levels, that is levels which are much, much greater than 3 kT separated from the conduction and valence band, they are generation recombination centers because they can trap electrons and holes and then annihilate the, they cannot take part in fast trapping, deep trapping processes which can only be taken part by shallow levels, okay? So deep levels are generally generation recombination centers. Also the Fermi level and capture cross section of the trap states determine whether a trap would be a deep trap or like it would take part in GR center, generation recombination process, or it will just be carrier trapping, deep trapping level, okay? Another important aspect that needs to be taken into mind is let us consider the conduction band and balance band. Any trap present in the above half of this band gap would typically be electron traps because they can easily capture and emit electrons. So their interaction with the electrons would be significant. Similarly, any trap in the below lower half of the forbidden gap would be hole traps. But what about the trap levels? So any trap here are electron traps, any traps here are hole traps. What about the trap levels which are near the mid gap states? These are typically the deep levels which are known as the generation recombination centers. Okay, now that we have qualitatively discussed the carrier trap interaction process, let us try to quantify these carrier emission capture processes. 
Okay. So let us try to model interaction of traps with electrons. So the electron can be captured, right, and emitted. So, so if we monitor the population of electrons in the conduction band, which is given by d and dt, right, rate of change of electron concentration in the conduction band, it would be governed by the emission of electrons, that is the rate of the number of electrons in the conduction band would increase if emission increases, it would decrease if capture increases. So it is process B, emission minus capture. Larger emission, then if emission dominates capture, then population of electrons in the conduction band would increase. If, em if emission is, if capture dominates emission, then the population of electrons in the conduction band would reduce and the electrons would be trapped in the trap state. So now let us look at process B, emission of electrons. So what is the condition of emission? The first condition is that the trap level has to be filled. So we denote the fraction of trap states filled as NT. NT is the fraction of trap states among the total number of traps which are filled. The probability that the, the chance that it would emit is given by this coefficient epsilon, uh, so EN, sorry, EN, emission coefficient emission En is the coefficient of emission. Okay. Now, let us try to model the capture process. The capture process would mean that you would need to have an electron available in the conduction band, which is given by the concentration of electron in the conduction band, this N. You have to have a free trap state, an empty trap state available, which is given by Pt the fraction of trap states which are empty. So n into pt means number of electrons available in the conduction band into number of empty states into the proportionality coefficient which is the capture coefficient cn. Okay. So now let us understand these emission and capture rates cn and en. What factors do they depend on? So this schematic drawn here shows a typical process of capture. An electron passing by a trap state would be captured by this trap state if it is within the capture cross section or within the field of influence of this trap state. So distance traveled by this carrier would be of the order of its thermal velocity Vth in a given unit time. And among all the carriers, only the carriers inside this cr cross section into this length, that is in inside this interaction volume would be captured. Therefore, Cn will be this area, which is this capture cross section into the thermal velocity. So it de determines the capture volume corresponding to a particular trap level. Sigma n is this area capture cross section into Vth is this total is the volume which caps which is accounted for in this coefficient Cn. So we looked at about electron population and its interaction with traps. Similarly for holes we can set up a differential equation. So we have taken into account electron population, hole population. Now what about trap population? How do you model how many traps would be filled? How many of them would be empty? So for that we again set up a differential equation in which we monitor the change in the trap of the, the change the time dependent change in the number of filled traps, the concentration of filled traps. So DDT of NT. This is nothing but if you separate, if you subtract DPDT, that is rate of change of holes minus rate of change of electrons, you can you can understand that this would lead us to, an to calculation of the number of traps filled by the filled by electrons in the traps level. Okay, so dnt dt would be dp dt minus dn dt and therefore we can rearrange our terms which gives us a differential equation of this sort. So this is our parent differential equation. Which, which takes into account all the four processes. We will apply this differential equation 
in our devices under certain conditions which will give us insight into how traps behave. Okay, so let us solve this differential equation, the parent differential equation under some specific conditions. In this case, let us solve it in that region of a semiconductor where the bands are flat, the conduction band or the valence band is flat. For example, such a region is called quasi-neutral region. Let us consider an NP junction. Regions far away from the PN junction would be such a quasi-neutral region. So in a quasi-neutral region, what we can consider is that the electron concentration in the conduction band, the hole concentration in the valence band is reasonably constant with respect to time. So with this constraint, if we solve the, depletion, uh, the differential equation, the expression for the number of traps filled by electrons per unit volume, which is given by NT, as a function of t comes out to be of this form. So nt naught determines the concentration of traps filled by electrons at time instant t equals to 0. There is this characteristic time constant tau which can be expressed in terms of emission rates, capture rates, electron concentration in the conduction band, hole concentration in the valence band. Okay, so the same term can be seen here, where capital NT is the total number of trapped states, total number of trapped constraps present per unit volume. <clears throat> okay, so what happens in steady state? So this expression is a tra is, it shows the evolution of the trap population, but what happens in steady state? That is, at a given condition what happens if I allow the system to achieve steady state that is if time approaches infinity. So the first term vanishes, the second term has two subterms, the last term the exponential terms vanish and we are left with this expression marked in red. Okay, so this determines, this expression relates nt that is number of traps filled by electrons to the total number of traps. So small nt by capital NT is a fraction of trap states filled by electron. That is how many traps will be filled by electrons. So this expression shows that the number of traps filled by electrons will depend on the number of available electrons or number of available holes. Also, it depends on the capture rates and the emission rates. So, carrier concentration and capture emission rates combined determines the number of trap states which will be filled by electrons. Okay, so in this derivation, we assume that both N and P are constant, but they are of similar magnitude. That is, one does not dominate the other. Now let us consider an n-type semiconductor. So if it is an n-type semiconductor, then obviously P can be safely ignored with respect to n. So that same expression now turns out that we can ignore the terms Cp into P. Wherever you have this P whole concentration, this term can be ignored. So the expression becomes the following. Wherein you see that the tau becomes only a function of En, Ep and N into Cn. So again what happens in steady state is shown here. Again the number of trap states filled by electrons in steady states is given by this expression. And since N is much higher, is, is a high value for an n-type semiconductor, so this expression becomes Nt is approximately equal to capital Nt. What does this mean? that all traps will be filled with electrons, all the traps in an n-type semiconductor in a quasi-neutral region would be filled with electrons in equilibrium condition or in flat band condition. 
how can we visualize this the the thing this is which is predicted by this statistics how do you visualize this this visualization is shown in the right hand side here bottom you see we have marked conduction band valence band position of the fermi level position of the trap level electrons which are available in the conduction band by virtue of the fermi level being close to the conduction band because of n type doping and therefore there would be lots of electrons in the conduction band which can then come back to these trap states okay because the trap states will have to be filled why why it has to be filled in steady state because the fermi level is above the trap level so ef is above et therefore these trap states cannot be empty and since n number of electrons in the conduction band would be in any case higher than the trap concentration so there would be larger so there would be large number of electrons and lesser number of traps and all these traps would there be successfully filled by the electrons from conduction band so therefore in an n type material given that the fermi level lies above the trap level and given sufficient availability of electrons in the conduction band all the trap states would be filled by electrons and, the ca and therefore capture process would be dominating emission process in this setting this is exactly what is predicted by the mathematics where you see that small nt is approximately equals to capital nt that is all traps would be filled by electrons in this condition okay now let us apply this understanding of trap statistics to a situation under bias condition in the previous case we discussed quasi neutral region where there is no effect of bias or field so let us start with a very simple device structure which is a short key contact so we have taken a piece of n type semiconductor we have deposited a metal such that this junction is a short key junction and therefore under zero bias there would be a built in potential and there would be a finite depletion region corresponding to this contact okay and there would then be a region beyond the depletion region which would be the quasi neutral region where the electronic band structure would be the bands would be flat there would not be any electric field all the electric field would be eaten up in the depletion region we will now assume that there is only one type of trap present in this system in the semiconductor one type of traps therefore there is only one level in the forbidden gap okay now let us focus in the quasi neutral region the derivation in the previous slide predicted that in an n type semiconductor in the quasi neutral region under equilibrium would be would 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 have all the traps filled with electrons so you see this blue circles with black fillings indicating that all the traps are filled by electrons this is again related by the band diagram shown in the right hand side where the trap levels are well below the fermi level and therefore these trap levels are filled by electrons okay now as we approach the depletion region so there is a band bending and since it is zero bias so the fermi would be constant all throughout the device structure so there is there would then be a region where the trap level would have to cross the fermi level so based on our discussion in the previous slides we can say that wherever the fermi level is above trap level the trap would be the, the probability that the trap would be filled by electron is higher therefore you see the black dots way up to the point just before the crossover after the crossover point the trap level crosses the fermi level and therefore these traps would be empty they would not be filled by electrons so inside the depletion region very near to the metal you have empty trap states present as you go away from the metal semiconductor junction deep into the depletion region and then away from the depletion region you will find the trap states to be filled okay so this is under zero bias now what happens when i apply a reverse bias 
reverse bias means I apply a negative bias to the metal this raises the band higher up the energy level because of the rise in the electrostatic potential because of the negative bias and what happens is that as this band these bands rise there would be more and more number of in more and more levels like this crossover would happen at a larger distance so there would be more number of traps which would be above the Fermi level which were initially filled because you see the depletion region edge has shifted right therefore it is expected that the crossover would also shift towards the right so there would be some there would be a lot of traps which were initially below the Fermi level which will find themselves above the Fermi level because of the extension of the depletion region okay this happens instantaneously just after the bias the depletion region immediately expands just after the bias to support the reverse bias and so what supports this extension of depletion region again so since this depletion region is extended this would be supported by these plus immobile charges arising out of the do donor levels nd plus so the nd plus levels will support the depletion region and the, and this now depletion region will now cover large number of filled traps because the quasi neutral region had filled traps now this quasi neutral region is encroached by the extended depletion region in order to support the immediate change in bias from zero to reverse bias right okay so these so now from the band diagram we also saw that there would be large number of trap states which would find themselves above the Fermi level right ET goes above Fermi level and it is expected that these trap states would then start to emit electrons so although the depletion region is extended these trap states which are filled at T equals to 0 plus immediately after switching they will start to emit electrons because this is what the ET minus EF arrangement demands okay so these electrons will therefore find themselves in a situation where they would want to emit from these trap states and therefore as these electrons are emitting from the trap states they leave behind they are leaving behind empty trap states and these empty trap states would mean an incremental increase in the positive charge in this region right if two electrons leave then there is a delta increase of two positive charge in this region so the depletion region required to sustain this reverse bias right minus v1 say you required two microns to sustain minus v1 given on the num which is determined by the number of positive charges available per unit volume right that determines how much the depletion region would be extended the moment these electrons start emitting from the trap states the number of positive charges per unit volume would increase because you now have positive charge coming not only from these immobile ions but also from the empty trap states given that the number of positive charges per unit volume increase because of the emission of electrons the depletion region starts collapsing it collapses to a certain point until a steady state is achieved okay so now I briefly discuss again summarize this flow of what the effect of bias conditions so under zero bias if you have a certain depletion region that increases immediately after switching to reverse bias under reverse bias most of the some of the field trap states find themselves in a situation where they would emit electrons so immediately after switching the reverse bias is sustained the depletion region is sustained by mainly the donor states say there are four donor charges 4 nd plus now when the electrons are emitted because of the band arrangement band bending arrangement et minus ef you have in addition to these nd plus charges you now have empty traps so if 4 nd plus was required to sustain this depletion region 
then now you have the same four positive charge but now supplied from Nd plus and Pt and, and therefore you would require a lower depletion region. The depletion region thickness has to reduce because the concentration of positive charge has increased. Okay, so how do you visualize this effect? So let us plot voltage versus time and number of the field trapped concentration versus time. So initially under zero bias, all the traps are filled, right, in this region. The moment you switch to reverse bias, there are lots of filled traps which would start emitting electrons. There are lots of filled traps which would start emitting electrons and therefore the concentration of field traps would drastically reduce. Exponential reduction would be observed with the characteristic time constant known as the emission time. So therefore this emission process would be can be studied and its emission time can be extracted if we can monitor this decay. So how do we measure this change in the trap concentration? How do we measure this variation? There are multiple ways. So any measurement that detects change in charge species can detect this, can monitor this curve. So you can use capacitance, you can use current, you can use charge. So for a short key junction, the direct way would be, let us talk about capacitance. So we saw variation in the depletion region because of the variation in the field trap configuration, concentration. So variation in depletion region due to NT would be reflected directly in capacitance because the depletion region width directly controls capacitance. Let us see how. Under zero bias, the depletion region is less, the capacitance is at a high value. The moment you apply a reverse bias, the depletion region extends right to a large to a large distance. So the depletion, the depletion region immediately after switching is large. And then with time, as the traps emit electrons, the depletion region shrinks and therefore the capacitance increases. Therefore, you see the capacitance versus time graph post switching captures this in information which we were looking for in order to extract the emission time constant. Okay, so we have two things. We have we, from this transient from region B to region C, we can extract the time constant and we can also monitor number of charges emitted by measuring the delta C, the delta change in capacitance. Okay, so if we try to model the capacitance in terms of charges in the depletion region, we can use this expression where C is proportional to square root of N by V. What is N? N is the charge in the depletion region. Okay. In an N-type material with deep acceptor states, N would be given by Nd plus minus Nt minus. Nd plus comes from the N-type doping. Nt minus comes from the deep acceptor states. Okay. If the acceptor states, states are empty, then this Nt minus vanishes. What is the other case? N-type material with filled deep donor states. Then filled donors are neutral. So the charge would be mainly Nd plus. N-type material with empty donor states. So empty donor states means positive charge. So Nd plus minus Pt plus. So Nd minus Pt. Okay. So you see this space charge region in NSCR, space charge region charge Determine, is determined by the dopant plus the nature of the deep levels. Okay, so this NSCR would therefore capture both ND and small NT, both dopant information and trap information. Dopant is a constant. Given a device, given a device structure, device process, the dopant part would be constant. We would then be left with the time dependent trap population part because the deep levels also contribute to the capacitance, right? So therefore the capacitance can be expressed in terms of deep level concentration, field traps concentration as this. Okay. 
so the goal of the previous slide was to show that the capacitance is a can be exp expressed as a function of both filled traps and empty traps okay so we now understood the emission of majority carriers that is emission of electrons in an n type semiconductor okay now we saw emission phase now what happens during capture how would the capacitance transient be during the capture okay so let us see what happens in the capture phase right so firstly let's begin with the zero bias just as we did for the emission phase studies so in the capture phase let's start from the zero bias then we switch the device to the reverse bias and keep the device in reverse bias such that for a given amount of time such that the device achieves a steady state so in our previous slide what is meant by steady state is that there would be some amount of donor impurities and the depletion region will house empty positively charged traps which is given by pt right so there would be nd plus and pt okay so we have reached steady state in the reverse bias so we have nd plus and we have pt okay so now we switch back to the zero bias state in the zero bias state the moment you switch back the change in bias demands shrinking of the depletion region because you have gone from a negative bias to zero bias that's a delta positive delta v so the the depletion region will have to shrink back okay since we have lots of empty positive charges now reciting in the quasi neutral region because of the shrinking of the depletion region so in so immediately after switching from negative to zero bias there will be lots of empty charges in the quasi neutral region and our calculation have showed that in an n type semiconductor in quasi neutral region would mean that there cannot exist empty traps because the trap level is below the fermi level right in an n type material the trap level would be below the fermi level given there is no band bending so this is true in this region and therefore these traps cannot remain empty and they will have to capture the electrons which are quite abundant in this n type quasi neutral region so the capture process starts taking place okay so the moment the capture process starts taking place the positive charge density per unit the number of positive charges available per unit volume which was a composition of nd plus and pt so that reduces so the con contribution from the empty traps reduces because the traps are slowly getting filled up they're getting filled up because they are capturing electrons and therefore now the depletion region has to extend because you you have lesser number of positive charges per unit volume okay so the depletion region extends initially it was say a value a it goes to a value a dashed which is which is lesser than a and then as the capture process happens and steady state is reached a dash again approaches a so it starts from a it reduces to a dash and then again goes back to a so the capacitance what happens region number 3 is a region of high, very high capacitance right because the depletion region has collapsed to a significantly lower value so the capacitance is quite high okay so as you are attaining steady state as the kd is captured the depletion region width increases from a dashed to a right this transition happens the depletion width increases what does that mean to capacitance if depletion width increases then capacitance reduces the capacitance reduces and achieves a steady state okay and then again if you go back to reverse bias then again you have this emission phase so from reverse bias to zero bias we have this capture phase from zero bias to reverse bias you have the emission phase why is this discussion important 
because now we have a handle we have an understanding that we can monitor capacitance versus time to study capture as well as emission from traps and therefore from there we can extract trap concentration and as well as the capture and emission rates okay So now we see that capacitance transient is the key to understanding or extracting trap parameters. So what is the goal? We have to probe capture and emission characteristics of deep levels in say an N type semiconductor using capacitance transients. So in this slide I prepared a table where we'll write down the trap processes and what does that mean for capacitance transients? if the trap is a majority trap, majority carrier trap or if it is a minority carrier trap. So we will discuss emission process with both majority minority carrier types. We will also discuss capture process with both my majority and minority carriers. Okay, so emission majority carrier we have discussed. When did we, what is the regime? When we are switching from zero bias to reverse bias. Capture majority carrier we have discussed just in the previous slide where we are going from reverse bias to zero bias. So emission means zero bias to reverse bias, capture means reverse bias to zero bias. In emission we saw the capacitance increases, right? Capacitance drops to a very low value and then increases. For capture of majority carriers, capacitance decreases, right? Okay. What is the device structure and how do you probe it? You can design a short key junction and you can probe majority carriers. But what about the interaction of minority carriers? For example, in an N-type semiconductor, you have traps and you want you have studied how electrons interact with these traps by studying short key junction. That is the first point and the third point. You want to study how holes would interact with the same trap level. So you have to make an arrangement of injecting holes, right? So you have to use a P plus N junction. A short key junction would not work because a short key junction does not inject minority carriers as efficiently as a P plus N junction would inject. So you have to inject holes and study the interaction of the holes with the deep levels in the N-type semiconductor. So accordingly, you have to pulse from forward bias to reverse bias to study emission of minor em emission of traps with their interaction with minority carriers. For capture, you have to pulse from reverse bias to forward bias. Okay. So the typical characteristics of the capacitance transients would be as shown below. If it is a majority carrier that is responding, because under if you have a device and if you get a transient, we have to understand and read from there what kind of carriers are responding. So if you see as you go from zero to reverse bias, that is when you are studying the emission processes, if you are going from forward bias to reverse bias, if you see a capacitance transient which goes down and then again bounces back then it means that there are majority carriers involved. However, if you see the capacitance is like this, the dotted graph, that means the minority carrier involved is involved because for minority carriers we ex accept, expect the capacitance versus time would be a decreasing trend. How do you understand that for minority carriers the capacitance versus time would be decreasing trend? You have to repeat these you have in your you can think through this by by repeating by understanding how the charges would change if minority carriers are being trapped okay so that will tell you why for majority carriers capacitance versus time will behave in the opposite manner if with respect to that when minority carriers are interacting okay so from the shape of the characteristics are from the value of delta C E, that is delta C at C0 versus C steady state. The delta C value, the, the sign, 
they help us identify if majority carriers are interacting or minority carriers are interacting. Okay, also from this transient you can always extract the emission times. For majority carriers it would give us this, this solid line would give us the emission rate of electrons. For minority carriers the dotted line would give emission rate for holes. Okay. Okay, so using the dip, uh, parent differential equation, how can we find out the emission time? The capacitance transients post switching from reverse bias to zero bias or forward bias to reverse bias, we found out that the capacitance transient can carries an information about both the amount of change in charges that carries the information about the trap concentration and it carries the information about the time constants. So we try to establish a relationship between the trap time constant tau and other trap parameters. So in order to do that in this slide I show the, deriva the derivation for the relationship between tau and other parameters is shown here. So we begin by setting the equilibrium condition. We assume that there is an equilibrium condition in the semiconductor which implies that the number of electrons emitted from a trap to the conduction band is equal or is balanced by the number of electrons captured from conduction band to traps. Because we know that in equilibrium there should be balance of all the opposing processes. This means that the d and dt would be zero because there is no change in the electron population in the conduction band. So if we set d dt equals to zero then generation minus recombination is equals to zero. Therefore the emission term must balance the capture term. And since it is in equilibrium so all the subscripts have this zero present in them. So from here using the u by replacing n naught with all the other semiconductor parameters such as intrinsic carrier concentration, Fermi level, intrinsic level, temperature, trap energy level, trap concentration. If you plug in these numbers and do some rearrangement then we come to a relationship of this form E n naught is equal to C n naught into n1. Okay, so this shows that there is a relationship between the emission rate and the capture rate. Okay, so this expression, although derived under equilibrium condition, can be extended to steady state condition with minimum errors. So we remove these subscript zeros and we write down that under steady state condition we can write. En equals to Cn into N1 or Ep is equal to Cp into P1. Now emission rate is defined as reciprocal of the emission time constant and the capture coefficient Cn was def defined as the capture cross section into the thermal velocity that the total, total capture volume right this is capture cross section area and this is the thermal velocity. So now that we have the expressions for En and Cn and we also have an expression for N1 which is shown here, we can fill in these, we can put in these terms here and what results is the following expression where the time constant tau E, the emission time constant is a function of the difference of the energy level difference between the trap level and the intrinsic level. It is also a reciprocal function of the capture cross section and the intrinsic carrier concentration and the thermal velocity of the carriers. Now one thing to note is that this capture process 
shows a 1 by kt dependence on temperature. So the first term shows this that there is an exponential of 1 by kt dependence. Let us see how temperature affects the other terms. So let us see so, so that we can extract what is the complete temperature dependence of the emission time constant. So, so thermal velocity depends on square root of temperature because it is like you can think of it like this kinetic energy which is proportional to v square is is equals to energy which is again proportional to t kt right so v square is related to t therefore v would be related to square root of t similarly nc the effective density of states near the conduction band h has a dependence of t to the power 3 by 2 okay so t to the power half into t to the power 3 by 2 becomes t to the power 2 so tau t to the power 2 is so if you take the temperature terms here the resultant expression is something like this tau t square is e to the power e c minus e t by k t okay now this expression if we will just try to understand or get a feel of how the time constant depends on the trap energy energetics and from there we'll try we'll get some important insights into how the traps respond how different types of traps would respond under different ambience temperatures so this graph represents time constant in the left y-axis and the energy position of the trap level referenced to the conduction band in the x-axis so zero means that the trap level coincides with the conduction band one means or in case of silicon as you go towards the right hand side it means that you're going away from the conduction band edge okay so as ec minus et increases you're going away from the conduction band edge so the exponential term increases and therefore the time constant increases significantly so you see as the energy difference increases by an electron volt there is more than sixteen orders difference in the time constant emission time constant right okay so again in the energy scale let us relate this to shallow and deep traps because we know that shallow traps are those traps which are within 3 by 3 kt band from the conduction band edge right so from 0 to 0 0.1 that is 100 milli electron volts this range we can assume to be the location for shallow traps because they are very close to the conduction band edge beyond that the traps would be termed as deep traps why are then deep traps dangerous because you see that the time constant of a deep trap say let us assume room temperature so let's see it's 300 kelvin like right the last line 300 kelvin in room temperature the deep traps would have time constants in the range of c to the power minus so if, if the deep trap is 0.5 electron volts away from the band edge then it would be a millisecond the time constant would be millisecond whereas for shallow traps it was in the range of a nanosecond and further deeper that you go <coughs> the emission from the trap to the conduction band becomes further slower and the time can become very high say one electron volts away from the conduction band edge and you will take 10 to the power 5 seconds 
for the electrons to emit from conduction band to the uh, from the trap states to the conduction band. 10 to the power 5 seconds for carrier emission. This is under room temperature without any excitation. It would be greater than 24 hours. That means an electron, if trapped, will take more than 24 hours to get detrapped or to get emitted from the trap state. But then we saw from the expression that tau is a strong is a function of strong function of temperature. Let us see how strong is the function. So the right so this here we see four five slopes, right? This is achieved, this is obtained by varying temperature T. So one notices that let us okay, let us fix a particular curve here. Let us fix that our trap state is at, ar at around 0.65 electron volts. So our focus would then be this vertical line. This trap state would then show an emission of 0.1 seconds at around 300 Kelvin, right? Now as we slowly reduce temperature, we see that this emission time increases. As I go from say 300 Kelvin to 250 Kelvin, the time constant changes from 0.1 seconds to 10 seconds. So there is two orders of increase. And from 250 Kelvin as we go to 200 Kelvin, from 10 seconds, it goes to 10,000 seconds. Or 10 to the power 5 seconds. So, if the temperature is varied by 100 Kelvin, the time constant varies by more than 6 orders. 6 orders of variation in time constant. The time constant re significantly increases. The emission becomes much, much slower as temperature reduces. If you increase emission, the temperature become if you increase temperature the emission becomes faster okay so using this graph this graph carries a hint it it highlights the problem of deep traps it also carries a hint of studying studying deep traps what is the problem of deep traps the problem of deep traps is that if you have, if the device if you have to measure the deep trap characteristics what do you have to do? If you go back to our short key structure description, if you want to measure deep trap characteristics, you would want the traps to capture electrons and then emit back, right? If you're going from A to B and then from B to C, you would want to observe the emission of electrons. But if you're doing this experiment in room temperature, and if the, if the trap present in your system is deep, <coughs> say more than 0.5 electron volts or so, then your capacitance transient will not show any change because you will not have any significant amount of emission happening because emission requires energy, right? So, in, so it, that is why it is temperature dependent because it has the, the electron will make attempts to jump out of the traps but then it sees a potential wall surrounding it and therefore it would need significant energy which will assist the electron to jump out of the well potential well okay therefore this shows this graph along with this expression shows that it is very difficult to study deep traps in room temperature without any thermal excitation given the time constants associated. So this graph also gives us a solution that okay in that case let us increase temperature. If we increase temperature this line is going to go down right this slope is this slope is going to go down and you could then have for the same energy level you would have lower time constants right. So in the emission would be faster if you raise the temperature. Therefore, 
the moral of the story is not only by bias can you excite the traps, although the bias creates a situation for the traps to be excited, the traps may not be actually excited, which requires temperature variation for actual excitation to happen. You need to have a higher temperature. So the transient changes from being a flat, almost flat, post switching from reverse bias to zero bias, sorry, from zero bias to reverse bias, it is almost flat when temperature is in the room temperature. But when the temperature increases, the capacitance shows a beautiful characteristics, which is in accordance to the discussion that we have had for a short key diode, indicating that there is strong emission from the deep traps. Okay. So, from this concept of temperature dependence of the emission time constant and its effect on the capacitance transients, a very important concept central, central to the deep level transient spectroscopy measurements comes out, images out. So this concept is the concept of the rate window. Let us again plot capacitance transient as a device short key diode goes from zero bias to reverse bias and we plot this for various temperatures. We plot it from a very low temperature to that in a very high temperature. So under very low temperature we will expect very minimum emission happening. So the capacitance transient is almost flat. Although switching has happened, the depletion region has increased but it is no more able to collapse back because emission is not happening. Now as I slowly increase temperature, the emission picks up, the emission starts, the emission rate increases and you see a slope coming in into capacitance transient. As the temperature increases further, this slope becomes prominent. So there's a there's a rising rising part in capacitance transient. And this becomes very prominent at a particular at a point and it keeps on increasing and the emission becomes extremely fast at higher very high temperatures. It becomes it, the emission becomes very very fast. Okay. So one method would be so what is the purpose of this exercise? That you have this capacitance transients and you fit these transients, right? You fit all these transients, you get a time constant tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, tau 4, tau 5, tau 6, tau 7, tau 8 at temperatures T1, T2, T3, dot 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 T8, right? You can fit, do exponential fits and ex extract the time constants. If you go back to the previous slide, you can then have a plot of tau with temperature and from that plot, you can get an Arrhenius plot, right? Because if you make ln tau t squared, this is Ec minus Ct by Kt. So log of this and 1 by Kt would give a straight line. And from that slope, you can extract the energetic location of this trap. And from the intercept of that line, you can get the information about capture cross-section. So that is our goal. Our goal is to find out information about traps. Among information, what do you mean by information? You mean you have to find out the trap time constants. You have to find out energetic location, its capture cross-section and the trap concentration. This is what we want to find out. So one method would be that you do a, you do a transient fit for each of the transients at different temperatures. The other method to get the same Arrhenius plot, that is to extract tau at different temperatures. The other method is that you define two lines at two time instants. You did not deal with the whole transient. You did not deal with the whole transient during data processing. What you do? You take two, two time instants at T1 and T2 and calculate CT1 minus CT2. So this window between these two yellow lines is called the rate window. 
and you calculate delta C as the change of capacitance between two time instants. It can be shown the delta C, so we had derived the capacitance, time dependence of capacitance in a few slides earlier and related it to various trap parameters. From there, if we find out delta C as CT1 minus CT2, we find that for a given window, the tau detectable, that is the maximum change that can be detected, happens when the tau is of this form. So what we have done is, we first found out delta C as CT1 minus CT2. Okay? And then, you do a derivative with respect to this variable tau e and set it to 0. And so, this would give us an expression for the tau e max that can be detected by this rate window. What does that mean? That this rate window will give you a signal whenever it detects it, this rate window will give you a signal or a peak whenever it detects a time constant of this value of T2 minus T1 by ln T2 by T1. So if you have to detect another time constant, say, say you detect tau1 by selecting a pair of time, const, time, time instants, time samples. If you change the time samples, this window will detect for you another time constant. Okay. So, this is how this signal is generated. This signal shows when does delta C peak or when there is a significant change in delta C and what is the temperature. So, for this rate window, you detect a tau E at a temperature T1. So, you see, if you, you do the same, so the result of this exercise is same to as that of the fitting process, fitting each and every curve and then getting tau and tau versus t, okay. Just that, this, the processing burden is significantly reduced because you need not handle the full transient, you have to just handle two time samples, t1 and t2, okay. So, with this concept of rate window, let us try to understand how you use DLTS signals. Okay. So, first of all, you set a defining rate window, right? You set a value of T1 and T2. What you input is set of capacitance transients at different temperatures. This is what you will do in the experiment. This is what DLTS experiment will do. It will calculate set of capacitances at different temperatures. You have a rate, rate window defined. So, you will, what will the rate window do? It will collect capacitance samples at T1 and T2 and it will calculate delta C. And then from delta C, you will get delta C max at the point where maximum change happens, right? So, delta C max is this point. Delta C max will happen at a temperature T1. That means that it has detected, if you are getting delta C max, that means this machine, this flow has, this algorithm has detected a time constant of the value of T2 minus T1 by ln T2 by T1. So, whenever this box detects a time constant of this value, it will, it will show a maxima in the delta C because this is the signal that indicates the change of capacitance. Okay. So, this is how you detect the time constant by defining the rate window. Now, what is the next step? You find out the temperature at which this peak has happened. So, you have a pair of T1, comma, uh, you have a value of T1, comma, T2. Let us say which is A, comma, B. You have detected one time constant at a particular temperature T1. 
You now if you want to detect another time constant, you val you vary the value of t1 comma t2 from a to another value, right? So the moment you change the rate window, you are looking for a different time constant. You are trying to detect a different time constant given by this formula. So you detect the different time constant. Let us say you detect this at a different temperature t2. So tau1 was detected at t1, tau1 was detected at t1, tau2 was detected at t2, tau3 was detected at t3. Like that you prepare a table for tau and t. What is the result? Let us focus on first peak, one peak at a time. So the result is that you can then plot ln tau t square versus 1 by t. Remember this expression for emission time versus temperature? In this expression, if you take natural log of tau t square and if you plot it versus 1 by t, you get a slope of Ec min minus of Ec minus Et by k. From the slope, therefore, you can get the energetics of the trap. The trap will give you the location, the, the slope will give you the location of the trap with reference with respect to the conduction band. The intercepts will give you the information of the capture cross section. Okay. Now this signal, this signal can have multiple peaks at different temperatures. So what does the presence of multiple peaks in delta C versus T plot mean? That there are multiple energy levels involved. There are multiple traps involved. Because this response can correspond to one trap, right? So the, if you deal with one trap, then you get one peak. And all the peaks would be around this peak. But if there are more than one traps present, then this would be multi-exponential kind of a transient. And the rate window would detect two more than one peaks, which, are, which would be well separated in the temperature scale. So therefore, whenever you get a when two different or multiple peaks in this in this capacitance signal, it indicates that there are more than one traps present in the semiconductor material. So we have to do the same exercise for each of these trap signals and generate this Arrhenius plot from by adjusting the rate window. And then we have to calculate the energetics, the energy levels. This is how you interpret the DLTS signal. So this signal, delta C versus time, is called the DLTS signal. So I'll just briefly reiterate what information regarding the traps can we extract from the DLTS signal. We can extract trap energy level from the slope of the Arrhenius plot. We can extract capture cross-section from the y-intercept of the Arrhenius plot. Although the point to be noted that this derivation of this expression was done under equilibrium condition, right? The tau that we derived, if we quickly go back, was done under equilibrium condition and was then extended to the steady state condition. But reverse bias diodes have, the problem is that in the reverse bias diode, the region in which we are looking for the emissions to happen have very high electric fields and they may be far away from equilibrium condition. And therefore these derivations may not completely accurately predict the value of the capture cross section calculated from this method. Although it can be used for comparison, but the absolute numbers may not be correct. The third point is trap concentration. You can have energy level, capture cross-section, and then trap concentration. As I had reiterated multiple times in the while discussing the capacitance transients, the change in capacitance, for example, if you look at this transient, right hand side, so the change delta C, right, calculated at this state versus calculated at a steady state, shows the amount of charges that have emitted. This delta C is an indicator of how many traps 
have emitted right and therefore this can be expressed in such a way that it gives a value of the trap concentration and so the relation typically used is this where you measure delta c max for a given rate window you can find out nt by nd that is for a given donor concentration what is the trap concentration in the system so for typical DLDA systems the minimum measurable nt by nd is nt is 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 times lower than the donor doping level okay what is the fourth information that we can get is by the shape of the capacitance transients if the DLTS signal is positive then it is a majority carrier trap DLTS signal if, if it is negative then it is a minority carrier trap so let us so if this is negative if you take two instance of time t1 minus t2 it would be negative if you take t1 minus t2 it would be positive for majority carriers it would be negative for minority carriers so DLTS signal would be positive for majority carriers and negative for minority carriers okay so you would note the usage of one term called measure measurement phase so I'll quickly tell you tell you typical what it was meant by this term for that let's go to this waveform yeah so in the discussion that we had for our short key diode we went from zero bias to reverse bias or we go from forward bias to reverse bias right so in the forward bias or zero bias what we are doing is we are basically setting the trap population which we are going to study under the next regime so the first pulse the first segment is called the filling pulse which sets the trap population the next segment is the measurement me measurement phase measurement pulse so the filling so the filling pulse in this case is a forward bias pulse the measurement pulse in this case is a reverse bias pulse and that is why we are using this phase as measurement phase in the demonstration session I'll show you how to choose the filling pulse and measurement pulse based on various other device characteristics okay now let us look at the DLTS setup now, now we have an understanding of DLTS signals the basics of traps now let us see how the setup is and what the, what are the components that are needed to carry out a DLTS measurement so the LTS setup basically relies on a computer controlled data acquisition and analysis process it has a fast capacitance measurement module with a conversion time of less than 50 microseconds and it can carry out low noise measurements which is very important for capacitance measurements we then have a cryostat which is used to vary temperatures because you see the key the central thing that is there in this DLTS measurement is to vary temperature to excite the deep traps so you go from liquid nitrogen temperature to a very high temperature controlled by a temperature controller and this wide range of temperature scan gives us information about deep traps wide range of deep traps present in the system okay we then have a vacuum pump which would then ensure that the chamber in which the device is probed so the, the, on the right hand side you see a platform on which the device can be probed and then the cryostat ensures that the temperature is controlled and the chamber is maintained in a vacuum less than 10 millitors so with an overview of the DLTS setup let us look at the steps of DLTS measurements although please note that this would be demonstrated clearly in the demonstration slide here I'll just give you a brief overview first is sample preparation typically we use short key contact or PN junction 
depending on whether you want to study minority carrier interaction or majority carrier interaction. On wafer samples can be probed using the probe positioners provided in the system. You can also probe packaged wafers by directly plugging in connections from the output leads. The moment the probing is done, the sample is prepared, we, the first step would be to do an IV characterization to find out the forward bias and reverse bias voltages for our filling pulse and measurement pulses. You have to here ensure that you do not go to a very high current in the forward bias or you do not go to a very, very high current in the reverse bias because the DLTS signal would degrade under high current conditions in reverse bias because capturing process would then start competing with emission. Our goal was to observe emission, but if capture starts competing with emission, then it would lead us to wrong conclusions. Post IV characterization, CV characterization needs to be done to estimate the carrier concentration profile, that is to find out the value of ND, the doping profile. Okay. Sometimes, since the measurement is based on capacitance measurements, series resistance becomes very important. Therefore, once the CV characterization is done, to estimate CV resistance, uh, the series resistance, a software capacitance calculator calculates the value of resistance based on various other material parameters. And this resistance would then show if this resistance is a matter of worry. The resistance number given out by the capacitance calculator based on the actual CV data would show us if the resistance is under acceptable within acceptable range or not. What happens basically is the resistance will, you know, interfere with the capacitance signal and will lead us to wrong conclusions. So once IV CV characterization is done, we load the sample into the cryo chamber shown here and we start our temperature scanning process. Typical temperature range accessed is from the liquid nitrogen temperature of 77 Kelvin to temperatures as high as 600 Kelvin. We have a control unit panel which houses the temperature PID controller which has a pressure gauge because we have to maintain chamber vacuum. For that we use a turbo pump to maintain chamber vacuum for less than 10 millitors, a diaphragm plus turbo package is present. And in addition to the temperature controller and pressure gauge, we have a source measure unit. The source measure unit supplies the pulses, the reverse bias, forward bias pulses to the diode and it also measures the fast capacitance transients. After the sample is loaded into the cryo chamber, we have the steps for data acquisition in which transients are averaged at a particular temperature so that a very good, very high signal to noise ratio signals are obtained and this process is repeated for multiple temperatures and then, temperature, and then the full data set is acquired for data analysis. Data analysis has two types of options. First is rate window analysis and the second is fitting all the transients. These two approaches are independent of each other and can be used to see whether the information obtained from these two approaches agree with each other. Okay. So once data analysis is done, this data, this information of trap energy level, capture cross section, trap concentration, can be used to simulate the DLTS signal. So it has a simulation module in which you can type in these numbers and the simulation module will generate a DLTS signal. We can then match the generated DLTS signal with the experimental DLTS signal and see if the analysis, the analysis values are correct. If they are not correct, then the simulation would help us to play with the numbers around the first analyzed values and it will help us get a get an accurate value for the trap for the value for the trap energies capture cost section etc post analysis acquisition analysis simulation 
you can it also provides the software provides a data library in which all the published trap energy levels and their capture cross sections is plotted and this library will help us identify which chemical species can this trap be attributed to so this is a typical dlts measurement software screen so you so there are six tabs cv profile iv ivt this is current voltage temperature profile deep level transient spectroscopy module current dlts module tas module and utilities in this cv profile and ivt will be done immediately after loading the sample the dlts module has two subsections data acquisition section data analysis section so this would be dealt with in details in the demonstration session so typical ex example showing the flow of measurement is shown here moment so first we start with the diode we do a complete scan from reverse bias to forward bias to identify the maximum reverse bias voltage so, such that the leakage is less than 10 microamps to ensure that the capture does not compete with emission we then do a cv measurement to find out bias versus depletion width why is this important because we have to modulate the depletion width in order to read traps in that particular region if you remember the discussion in the schottky diodes understanding their behavior once you switch from reverse bias a uh, zero bias to reverse bias so the trap information will be obtained only in the region where the depletion region has changed the region that the region where the depletion region moves through so you have to select the filling pulse and the reverse bias measurement pulses in such a way that a particular region of the depletion particular region of the semiconductor responds to your bias that is why the depletion width versus bias relationship has to be obtained third is optimization of the capacitance transients moment you are you, you are set with the filling and measurement pulses you have to optimize the capacitance transient by varying parameters such as pulse width by playing with the filling and measurement pulse values and try to optimize the capacitance signal this optimization has to be done at room temperature as well as at higher temperatures in which you are at peak is expected the next is we run the dlts scan with these optimized pulse parameters filling pulse measurement pulse fit pulse width number of averages etc and then we get a full scale full scan from liquid nitrogen temperature to high temperature and then we generate a rate window Okay, so for a given rate window, we get a particular DLTS signal. So this is delta C by C naught versus temperature. Okay, then from that we convert to the Arrhenius plot, as discussed in the theoretical portion. And one can get a Arrhenius plot of this sort with one by k t versus tau t square. This is t square. One by e is nothing but tau right emission rate is reciprocal to tau so this is tau t square versus 1 by kt and from this you can get the energy level and capture cross section okay sometimes what happens and this might happen frequently is that you would get straight line like pattern somewhere and some scattered points in between okay so this might be attributed so there seems to be a third peak present peak number 1 peak number 2 and some third peak so this again goes off this can be checked if you increase so you have to fit the dlts signal right so this dlts signal has to be fit before generating an arrhenius plot so this fitting can be done by higher order polynomial so one has to check if you increase the order of the polynomial thus the scatter goes off and it becomes a straight line indeed for this sample data 
if the polynomial fitting order increases one notices that this vanishes the scatter vanishes and it becomes a, a straight line like feature so there are indeed three traps present in the system so how do you verify these numbers that that okay so you found out three traps just by changing the polynomial order now how do you verify that yeah indeed these three traps are present so as i said that there is a simulation module you have to plug in these energy levels capture cross sections resu resulting from each of these arrhenius lines give it to this software and this software will simulate the dlts signal if the simulated dlt signal overlaps with the experimental dlt signal that means indeed there are three traps present in the system okay so let us quickly summarize the dlts measurement flow the first step is to choose the proper filling and measurement pulse parameters based on the ivcv characterization second is to to carry out capacitance transient measurements we have to maximize our capacitance signal the transient amplitude we have to ensure that all the traps are filled we have to then do a proper rate window analysis and generate arrhenius plot we can then do transient fitting of each of these capacitance transients at different temperatures and we can do an arrhenius analysis of that of the information obtained from the transient fitting so you can do arrhenius analysis from the rate window information you can do arrhenius analysis from transient fitting okay so now that we have an idea of deep level transient spectroscopy let us go to the other modules of dlts the other module is double pulse dlts which is also known as ddlts so in dlts we got the information of trap energy level trap concentration but we do not have yet have the information of how the traps are distributed with position from the junction so we do not have the trap profile information the spatial distribution of deep traps also we do not have the information how electric field modulates these traps because we know that electric field would significantly modulate the trap any energy barriers which affects the emission rates so for trap profile analysis the method is that you vary the filling pulses and you keep the measurement pulse fixed for for field profile analysis you have to fix the filling pulse and vary the measurement pulse this would be discussed and showed in the demonstration session in details now let us understand what the ddlts process is so for the conventional dlts if you look at the waveform you have a measurement window you have a filling pulse window you have a measurement window and filling pulse window followed by measurement window and we calculate we we take capacitance transients in the measurement window okay but this does not give any spatial distribution of traps but in double pulse dlts what you do is you vary the filling pulse window you keep the measurement pulse value same you vary the filling pulse what is the filling pulse filling pulse is the forward bias pulse so if you keep on increasing the filling pulse it means that the depletion region collapses more towards the junction right filling pulse increased means more towards forward bias so more collapse towards the depletion region uh, towards the junction so let us take two two signals so, say say consider filling pulse 3 or filling pulse 4 you have two capacitance transients so how does this transient happen the the, the depletion region extends to a point far away from the junction and then it collapses back to a point if you increase the filling pulse then the collapse will happen to a point the collapse will become more strong and so if you subtract these two transients capacitance transients obtained in the third measurement with that obtained in the next fourth measurement you would get the information of traps in this incremental region for the third measurements say vp the the depletion region would collapse to a particular point for the fourth measurement the depletion region will coll collapse to this point so if you subtract these two transients the the delta capacitance will give information about the concentration of traps in this window 
in this yellow window. So you can say that the concentration of traps in this at, at, in this window is of this value, and this this, this window can shift as the filling pulse increases. <coughs> so this is how the double pulse DLTs can be used to extract the spatial profiling of the deep traps. Okay, in addition to capacitance DLTs, so these measurements that we discussed till the previous slides were all based on capacitance monitoring. In addition to capacitance monitoring, another method is present which is called current DLTs. Why is it that capacitance is not sufficient? Because generally the modern scaled MOSFETs have device capacitance which are quite low. And if the capacitance is quite low, then the capacitance measure meter will have hard time in measuring the capacitances and, the, and it would not be a very good signal. So we need to monitor drain current in that case. So typical measurement sequence is similar to that of the D capacitance DLTs. We keep the MOSFET in off state in the accumulation mode, then apply a drain bias. Then for the fixed drain bias, we switch the gate of the transistor from off state to on state and then we monitor the current transients. How does the capacitance, uh, how does the transistor turn on as the gate is switched from off to on? In the off state, the traps would have captured the majority carriers. So there would be a space charge region that would be present when the device turns on and the drain current starts flowing. And as the drain current starts flowing, the carriers would slowly start to emit from the traps and the depletion width and the threshold voltage would change with time. So initially when it was in off state, the carriers were captured, there was a depletion region. When this device is suddenly turned on, this trap state would emit, the depletion region would collapse and this would lead to a threshold voltage change and all these parameters would be reflected as a time dependent change in the drain current. So the drain current, say your MOSFET gives a fixed I1 in the on state. But if you want, the moment you switch it on, immediately it will not go to I1, but it will follow a transient and reach your I1. So this transient depends on how the traps are emitted. And the same, by the same rate window analysis of this drain current transient, one can extract trap information. Okay. So for current DLTS and for capacitance DLTS, we had used temperature as the primary excitation source for deep traps. In addition to temperature, one can use optical pulses. One can use light to probe the optical properties of traps. One can use light to facilitate minority carrier injection because light can generate, if you select a proper energy, optical energy, then electron hole pair generation would happen, which would facilitate minority carrier injection. And this is helpful for, subs for materials where semi-insulating materials are present, where carrier injection otherwise is difficult. What does light do? It imparts energy to the trapped carriers. In addition to thermal energy, we can use optical energy. So whenever using optical energy, we can keep the temperature fixed and vary the optical energy. Second is you can use the generation of electron hole pairs to control the trap population. So similar to the filling pulse segment where we used it to control the trap population, you can use optical energy to generate electron hole pairs which would then in turn control the trap population. Okay. So now that we know about capacitance DLTS, we have we briefly went through current DLTS, optical DLTS, double pulse DLTS. Let us quickly highlight some key measurement concerns associated with the DLTS measurement. Although during my discussion I have already highlighted these points, but I wanted to separately bring it out so that 
one uh, one is conscious about these issues first is leakage current it has been noticed that dlts peak amplitude that is delta c versus temperature dlts dlts peak amplitude reduces in leaky devices if your device is leaky then there would be a competition between capture and trap emission and therefore any signal from emission would be significantly reduced okay the second is series resistance effect the dlts signal becomes weak and can even reverse signs when the series resistance becomes dominant and that would lead to an incorrect conclusion that the trap has become a minority carrier trap so the dlts signal reversal was attributed to majority and minority carriers right but this can happen also because of the series resistance third is ensuring that the traps filled during the filling phase is complete so incomplete trap filling is an issue so we have to select the filling pulses in such a way that we ensure that the filling of all the traps is completed in the filling phase okay and the fourth is the instrumentation configuration so we have to deal with deal with the pit controller for temperature control we have to deal with vacuum so one has to ensure that vacuum is reached less than 10 milliliters and one has to ensure that the pit controller controls the temperature well enough without significant overshoots and undershoots and the probing is done correctly so these are some instrumentation issues that needs to be kept in mind so this presentation was prepared by studying materials shown in this reference the first reference is the key paper the first paper on the deep level transient spectroscopy method and it gives a very good insight into the dlts method some tutorials are also cited schroder's book is a is a very important book in studying characterization in semiconductors it has a very detailed chapter on dlts and some of the setup discussions were taken from the semitrol manual semitrol is the manufacturer of our dlts setup and so i hope if somebody wants to delve deeper dive deeper into dlts measurement technique then one can go through these references thank you for patiently hearing out this session thank you